CO2 only plants, we have not forgotten about you. This is a two-part video series. We're gonna talk about corrosion in CO2 only amine plants. We're gonna start with the absorber. We're gonna move on to the uh, rich amine piping. And then part two of the video series, we're gonna tackle the regenerator and reboiler. So strap in guys, there's a lot to know about corrosion in CO2 only amine systems. Welcome to the Experts Network. Welcome back to the Experts Network. My name is Ben Spooner. I'm a senior process engineer with Amian Experts. And in today's video, we want to discuss the corrosion mechanisms that we commonly come across in CO2 only facilities. So whether you're an LNG plant, a biogas plant, a midstream, or anyone who's dealing with gas containing only CO2 and no H2S, this video is for you. Now, several different types of amines can be used for CO2 removal. Uh, a lot of plants nowadays are using either MDEA or MDEA plus piperazine. It kind of depends if you want to remove just some of the CO2 or all of the CO2. You can also use MEA or DGA. We've come across several facilities using those two amines, again, for complete CO2 removal. Now, depending on the type of amine you're using does somewhat depend on the type of corrosion that you could possibly be exposing yourself to if you don't understand the chemistry of the amine or the correct operation of the amine. So let's kind of go through the amine plant uh, piece by piece. Let's start with this nomograph. My colleague Mike Sheelan got us this. has been very handy to help explain CO2 corrosion and quite simply, on one side of the nomograph, we have the CO2 uh, pressure or partial pressure. And on the other side, we have temperature. All right. And depending on the pressure of the CO2, it kind of tells us at what temperature we can start to expect corrosion. The long and short of it is what we want to avoid is a situation where we have CO2 under high pressure combined with high temperature. Pressure plus temperature equals possible corrosion in a CO2 system. Uh, here's an example. This is an absorber. Bad, bad corrosion inside this absorber. And when we went in to inspect it, after seeing that the metal thinning was severe on our ultrasonic testing, we could see very clear uh, like pits, okay? CO2 leaves pits. It's a, it's a clear cut evidence of CO2 related corrosion. When you see these, here's a better picture, some, these what we call round bottom, but very sharp edge pits. Now, whether you're an absorber or regenerator, it's a little bit different how these pits form. Uh, these pits can form simply if it's, if it's a, a bare metal wall and we get a droplet of water sitting on the metal and then the CO2 reacts with the water. Of course, CO2 plus water gets you carbonic acid and it just sits there and kind of dissolves the metal. So we see those in stagnant, hot environments like the bottom of a regenerator. But the picture that we just showed in the absorber, what, what we think probably happened there, hard to say because of course the, the vessel is all clean before we open it up, but CO2 plants do form a bit of a film on the metal wall, similar to an iron sulfide film, but in a CO2 plant, it's iron carbonate. And the difference is between iron carbonate and iron sulfide is iron carbonate is far less protective. It's more soluble, uh, especially if the amine's got some salt in it, some conductivity to it, some, some maybe some heat stable salts, uh, will just dissolve the film. And the other thing is when the film is laid down, if it's in a high velocity area or turbulent area, you get quite a porous film. So the film is there, but it's porous, meaning molecules of CO2 can get in behind it and there they're able to attach onto the metal wall. Of course, there's lots of water in, in, in the middle of an amine absorber. And so again, we get this pitting formation and that's what we think happened in this absorber. Now, what could the operators have done about it? Well, when we look at the temperature profile of the absorber, we can see here the temperature bulge is, first of all, in the middle of the tower, not where we want it, and it was too hot. 
It was too hot. It was getting up well above 180 degrees Fahrenheit or about 80 degrees Celsius. And this, the particular conditions we modeled it here, it was hitting about 182 degrees F. Okay, that's definitely reaching the upper limit of what we want for a carbon steel amine absorber. We do feel talking to the operators that because the gas flow rates were fluctuating, the CO2 rate was fluctuating, that probably this maximum temperature mode was fluctuating as well. Now, keep in mind, those of you using piperazine activated MDEA, uh, this piperazine is awesome for removing CO2. Very rarely are you going to go off spec on CO2 if you have piperazine in your amine, but it's really exothermic. So when it reacts with CO2, it generates a lot of temperature, okay? And uh, remember, a lot of these absorbers are also under quite high pressure. So we're back to that nomograph where we showed high pressure, high temperature. That's what's going to give you corrosion. So quite simply, the plant was under circulating their amine, allowing the temperature bulge to get too high inside the absorber. We really like to see temperature indicators throughout amine absorbers when they're used in CO2 only systems like in this example here. So the operator can just glance at his DCS screen, know exactly where the temperature bulge is occurring in his absorber and also how hot are things getting. All right, keep things below 180 degrees if possible. At the same time, this, this absorber we're talking about was dealing with a really high richly loaded amine, 0.65 mole per mole. Uh, the equilibrium loading, which we had to use a simulator to figure out, was at like 95%. So it just was a really loaded up amine. Either increase the amine circulation rate or possibly increase your amine concentration to try to get those values under control. So temperature in an amine absorber, critical when we're dealing with a CO2 only plant. Next, uh, along the rich amine piping, another somewhat common area for us to see corrosion, not as common as absorbers and regenerators, but it definitely can happen. And there's two things we got to worry about in CO2 only plants. One is velocity and the other again is our rich loading. Uh, here is an example where it's the absorber level control valve. You can see the pipe had to get a lot thinner in order to fit the valve and then it opens up again. Well, what happens when you squish the amine into a smaller pipe and then open it back up again is you dramatically affect its velocity. And then Bernoulli's theorem comes into to play. What can happen is we start adjusting the velocity of flow. We adjust these static versus dynamic pressures. And you can flash off gas out of the amine, flash off CO2. Uh, especially if the amine is overloaded in the first place. So we don't want high velocity and we don't want uh, high rich loading. So velocity is more controlled by amine circulation rate and rich loading also controlled by amine circulation rate, but also amine concentration. Don't let those two parameters get away from you. Here's another example. This is of a, uh, a flash tank level controller. Um, kind of the same thing now. It was a gate valve, it was only partially open. Not the way we like to see gate valves used. It's like putting your thumb over the end of a garden hose and the amine was spraying through that very high velocity, high pressure drop across that valve. We're flashing off a lot of CO2. And again, we can see those telltale pittings, round bottom, sharp edges pit pitting on the downside of the valve, we know that just simply CO2 is breaking out of the amine. So we don't want to overload our amines. What should the maximum rich loading be in a CO2 only situation? Well, in general, they're lower than in plants that have high C uh, H2S to CO2 ratios. It's a big difference between say like a gas plant or LNG plant and a refinery. Refineries tend to be very high in H2S, whereas gas plants and LNG plants tend to be, you know, depending on where you're located, lower in H2S and higher in CO2. So if you're dealing with something like MEA, okay, typical 15%, we don't recommend you operate at above 0.4 mole per mole loading. Same with it if it's just a generic MDEA system. Okay, generic MDEA, high CO2 to low H2S ratio, again, around 0.4 mole per mole loading is about as high as you want to go because you know you're not going to have any kind of protective film or layer on your inside of your piping wall, so you can't afford to have CO2 flashing out. Your metal's not protected against it. Uh, if you're using DGA, because it's a very strong amine, 
You tend to operate it right up at that 50% range, means you don't have to circulate high rates. The chances of the CO2 flashing out are less in a DJ system, so you can take advantage and run it a little bit higher, rich loadings of around 0.5 or so. Finally, MDEA plus piperazine, Piperacine, when it grabs H2S, it does not want to let it go, and so it hangs on tightly. You can go up to about 0.6 mole per mole in, a, in an MDA plus piperazine. But keep in mind, a 0.6 mole per mole means you're not circulating a lot of amine, and now we got to make sure we're not getting an, a, 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 a big temperature bulge in the absorber. Okay, so we've covered... Corrosion of the absorber and corrosion of the rich piping. In part two of this video series, we're gonna talk about corrosion of the regenerator and the reboiler. Those are the most uh, common areas we see corrosion in CO2 only plants. For Stay tuned for part two of this video series and we'll cover them then. Thank you very much.